We take a single episode of a science fiction TV series and overanalyze it to within an inch of its life. This is the Fusion Patrol Podcast. Welcome to the discussion. Hello and welcome to another episode of Fusion Patrol. I'm Eugene. And I'm Ben. And tonight we're going to be looking at the 1970s Fantastic Journey episode, Turnabout. Another classic. 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 It's a classic. Oh, oh. Summary to follow. Having walked all the way through the portal from the last time zone, the weary travelers start to make camp for the night. Leanna decides that to let Mr. Whiskers stretch his legs after all that walking, and they leave the group. Soon, she is captured by a cage ray gun wielded by lecherous-looking men. Mr. Whiskers returns to the other travelers and alerts them that something has happened to Liana. They follow her trail to an advanced city, dominated by men who keep women as slaves and treat them as second-class citizens as well. Slaves and second-class citizens they may be, but they also maintain the amazing computer complex that keeps the city running. Our travelers are disturbed by the attitude of the men to their women, but unbeknownst to them, the women are about to turn the tables on the men and stage a revolution. The computer is tampered with, and the men are simply winked out of existence. The computer has determined that the travelers do not hold the same attitudes towards women as the indigenous men, so the queen of the women decides to keep them as breeding stock, because, you know, attitudes about women are passed on genetically rather than by education. Pointless plot complication number one. Varian pretends that Liana's a rotten man-hating shirker, and after quite a lot of prodding, Liana catches on and plays the part so she can stay with the women. This has no further bearing on this story. Plotless, pointless plot complication number two. The men, being held prisoner, are being fed a poison. Not just any poison. This is one of those poisons that doesn't hurt you unless you stop taking it regularly. Now they have to stay, even though the women didn't bother to tell them, thus rendering the deterrent ineffective. Pointless plot complication number three. It appears that the men haven't been vaporized after all, but are in some bizarre timeless limbo. Pointless plot complication number four. The computer has the power to return the men to the women as... Night visitors, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, and alter their personalities so that they're a lot nicer and loving to the women. This just pisses the queen off because she obviously loves the big jerk her husband owner was and is upset that this is just a night visitor. Pointless plot complication number five, the computer sends robots to kill the woman who maintains it. It is mad. It has been tampered with. The computer also refuses to set up any more night visitor booty calls for the ladies. Luckily, Jonathan Willoway knows about computers, and the Queen begs him to repair the computer. When he learns that they have no spare parts to replace the ones that are broken, he explains he cannot repair the computer. Willoway is then sent to jail to reconsider this. He's also made to watch Varian and Scott suffer poison withdrawal. Meanwhile, Fred has avoided capture and is trying to get his medical bag to make an antidote to the poison. He's chased and then makes friends with one of the women who helps him rescue his friends. Willoway pronounces the computer insane and that it must be shut down. When the queen finally agrees, Willoway refuses on a matter of principle. But then he relents. Pointless plot complication number six. The woman who who maintains the computers tells Willoway that there's a failsafe to turn the computer off. Within 15 seconds, he must disconnect three components in three different consoles in the correct order. This process and these components have not been documented. Willoway will have to guess. Further, should I make this pointless plot complication seven or just keep it with six? The entire complex will explode if he fails to complete the task within 15 seconds. Pointless plot complication seven, or or perhaps this one's eight, depends on how you look at it. The computer is armed with lasers. Meanwhile, it sends its robot army to kill everyone else. Willoway succeeds! Yay! But then he turns it back on long enough to return the men, who have clearly learned their lesson. Don't let the women use the computer, which is no longer a problem, as the computer's been destroyed. What will tomorrow bring for this society? Anyway, that's it. I I couldn't even call this a plot. That's why I just put it into a series of ridiculous plot complications. Because this this one in I this was my naked Montague. It was mine as well. I was this was this was my naked. 
This was my naked Montague, without question. This episode irritated me from from, from the word go. I mean, I they mean, just yeah. kept throwing. It's like they had a little, uh, I don't know, a bag with index cards that they'd written script ideas on. And they'd reach in and, they, I don't know, they'd take a hit of whatever it was that they were doing. And then they'd pull a card out and go, oh, yeah, Robot yeah. Army. Yeah. <laughs> the part that actually got me really upset. I mean, at one point, I literally just paused because I was becoming so incredibly angry. Oddly enough, was actually how poorly written the women of this community were Oh, well, were written get Joan as. Collins playing the lead. And, and say what you will for Joan Collins. She's not an actress. Oh, uh, no, no. Oh. No. Well, no, well she, she was okay in Star Trek. Sitting Ninja Forever. She was, she was kind of okay on that. Yeah. But th- this, is, this is long past that. All of the women here, well, especially Joan Collins. I mean, clearly, because she's she's the queen. Uh, Did she have a name? Yes. Uh, oh. ha, um, see, I had it actually written down, and now I can't find it. I am so blessed. Oh yes, Haliana. Haliana, great name. Yeah. What really bothered me is that usually with every revolution, the if if the oppressed manages to win, it's because they wish to usher in. Um, I don't want to say a, a golden golden age, but they want to they want to bring in uh, a new idea, uh, a new start, and do away with everything that they had been subjected to, and instead all we got was a turnabout. Amazingly, that was the name of the episode. Yeah. Turnabout. I mean, I, but that but that, that that is what we got. I mean, this it's, it was just a, a role reversal at this point. Now the women are the oppressors, and the only excuse we finally get. Is at the end, and this this is what really oh, that bur- burned me to no end. I know what it, it is. It's where she says, um, "I've only, you know, I, I've never known how to lead or uh, give give orders. I've only known how to take them." Yeah, and that thought, was that's, really that's irritating. Rubbish. I'm sorry, I cannot accept that. I mean, it is human nature to want to try to turn over a new leaf, especially if you have been an oppressed class. I mean, we've seen that repeatedly throughout history. So if and it will really, what really bugs me is that this episode was co-written by D.C. Fontana. I was going to bring that up. The, the, the D.C. Fontana connection is kind of interesting. I, I, I think I've mentioned, at least on the podcast before, that, that I've been going through the These of the Voyages books. And, and, you know, you learn some things about who was doing the work and who wasn't doing the work and who was throwing things up. And, and D.C. Fontana is definitely one of the people who was picking up the pieces and kind of behind the scenes doing a lot of important stuff. I mean, that's why she worked her way up into to a script editor was because she'd done some really good stuff on Star Trek. Some of the stuff I don't think is even credited to her. No, it's, it's, she did. it's given a different name because and, she and didn't she, want her name released because of uh, gender well, issues at the D- time. D.C. Fontana is her gender fake name. That is yeah. that is true. But I think she also – but that – she used uh, a, a different – totally different name in the beginning. Um can't remember what it is. Yeah. Well, anyway, there are times when somebody else wrote the script and then she came along and made significant changes that make the script what you would recognize it to be that Star Trek script. And it's, you know, it's her. And and um, so, yeah, I have a I, I have a lot more respect for her. But, you know, she's doing a lot of stuff here on Logan's Run and uh, Fantastic Journey. And it's really dire. I'm trying. I'm, I'm beginning to think that there is another person with the name DC <laughs> Fontana. I, I, because this is not the same quality of work. Now, well, it is written with somebody else. So the question Ken is, Kolb. is her name on there because she tried to fix Ken Kolb's incredibly awful script and couldn't do it, or is this truly a collaborative effort? And I don't know the answer to that question. It probably should have before uh, starting this podcast, but that's too much like research, and it and it and it would be too painful. But you know, there's DC Fontana is of the the Roddenberry school of you know social issues, and so here's your feminism episode. This is like the most poorly done feminism episode of any series I've ever seen, ever. And yeah, and but but it is, but it, that's what it is. I mean, this you know we were making a claim that that Fantastic Journey last time we were talking about it does not really isn't really science fiction well <clears throat> here here they're they're trying that that whole 
social science-y, fiction-y thing, uh, and they're not doing it very well. Oh, how about they're doing it outright badly? Outright badly? Okay. I can, I can accept outright badly. Um, and it's not just the story. I mean, yes, it's, it is very annoying when, when Queen Hollyoaks says, um, I'm, I just don't know how to be a leader because I've always been a slave. Okay, there's a certain amount of truth to that, but that's, you know, I don't know how to do accounting because I've always been a, a slave or, you know, something like that. But um, Well, I mean, like, for example, she's constantly being ordered around. Before the revolution takes place, she's always, she and the other women, totally being ordered around, totally being told, do this, take care of that, get this thing, whatever it is. She was always being pushed around in terms of what she needed to do. Now she has an opportunity to ask for help and from people who the computer says do not hold the same they do not hold attitude. the same va- the, exactly they do not hold the same attitude as the men of the community and yet she just turns around i mean i suppose they're trying to well but she's keeping them for breeding stock which, that's true well, but be that as it may it's even like Scott. she can't even conceive the idea that, you know, I kind of got bullied a bit when I was the oppressor or the oppressed, I should say. Maybe I should uh, think differently about these people here. Or are they trying to uh, kind of go with that whole psychobabble of the, you know, the, the abused syndrome? I don't know. But, you know, when they, she says she doesn't know how to lead, she knew how to lead well enough to organize a revolution. Yeah. So... Even though uh, she even, really didn't do much of the work. I mean, she had someone else go in there and do it for her. Well, the person who knew what to do. Yeah. Um, All she simply said was, you do it. And somehow, maybe because she was married to Grunt Man. Did, did you get the impression from the way it was written that, you know, like she was giving instructions to the other women and she was saying, be ready and etc. Yeah, she did. That's true. Okay. Yes. And then the men disappeared. Yeah. So it's like, be ready for what? They obviously didn't know the men were going to disappear. They, I don't know what they thought was going to happen to the men, but they clearly didn't think they were going to be disappeared because why do you need to be ready? I mean, they're just gone. Okay. Well, nothing to be prepared for other than, I don't know. I don't know. They, they won't ever have to worry about the toilet seat being up anymore. I, I, I I really don't didn't understand that it came as a complete surprise when they disappeared, and well, and then and, of and course, you, and then that was uh, well. And then you bring up a really good point. It's like, okay, this this is something that came as a complete surprise to everybody who was there, and yet they have this already. Let's take it for granted technology in each person's room that tech that allows you to have a night visitor. <laughs> Yes, the night visitors. Um, computer-generated booty call. <laughs> yeah, which obviously somehow tapped into, even though it did kind of repro. Well, what was he? I mean, f- I don't know. Was he the guy from the, the the Phantom Zone brought forward and his personality altered, or was he a projection? And if he was, if he was a projection, then okay, fine. If he was the guy, then how have they done night visitors in the past? Or Precisely. did the men not have night visitors? And I'm going to say, I don't believe that. No, I don't believe that either. Not if they had that technology. No, exactly. I mean, they must be using it. And the other thing that really gets me is, okay, the only way that the attitude could be altered is if he's not real. However, at the very end, when all the men are freed, he does have some memory, memory of, of the event of the event exactly it's a little fuzzy but he does remember something about it and you know and then holly uh, holly Oak, she confesses you know well i i, I had you had you had you summoned or i don't know if she refers to him as a duplicate i don't know but the whole thing makes absolutely no <laughs> sense <laughs> it, i mean it becomes just the worst mcguffin uh in and that entire the scene at the end because they didn't seem like they were particularly uh, incensed at having been put in the uh, Phantom Zone. They seemed like they were, uh, I don't humbled, know, I mean, they were kind of like humbled, I confused. It's like, oh, we're back, great. I, I think that probably wouldn't be my first reaction if I'd just been banished to the Phantom Zone for a long period of time. By the way, of course, as soon as, you know, we're presented with the typical 
fantastic journey. It looks like everything's going to work out because we understand that thing. But I, I seriously, as soon as our travelers are gone, the men are going to go, what, the computer you used to overthrow us is no more? Huh. Well, get to the kitchen. Mm-hmm. I, I, I can't, because that isn't the sort of thing that just one trip to the Phantom Zone uh, overcomes. Uh, attitudes towards women or towards men or towards any group of people that are not yours, uh, those attitudes change with time and with education and with tolerance and understanding. They do not get put there by fear of going back to the Phantom Zone. No, and, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think so. I mean, not for that short a time. I mean, it's a, it's a type of incarceration. But given the amount of time that passes in this episode, I can't believe that that was significant enough for all of the men to suddenly have a change of heart. Yeah, Although, it just doesn't. It just doesn't hold up. However, how many times have we seen this kind of abrupt change in attitudes in previous episodes? So really. This one is just kind of still following the formula. That's true. I, you know, I think they were in there long enough to uh, have experienced the thing we never see on elevators. You know, when somebody gets trapped in an elevator in a TV show, obviously the thing that always happens is uh, there's a pregnant woman who has a baby there. I mean, that's, that's what happens on trapped elevators. But I know that what really happens on a trapped elevator when somebody's stuck on the elevator for 10, 12 hours is they don't have a baby they have a, let's call it a poo. Ah! Think about that. Yeah. What do you do? Do you designate one corner? You know, you've got five people in an elevator, and you're in there for ten hours, and you're like, uh... It's like, all right, let's pick a corner. Uh, uh, and, and then your journey is even worse. So, you know, if those guys were there long enough, the place could have smelled pretty bad. So, it's, Unless it's they possible. were in some form of... I mean, as you said, if it is indeed an equivalent to a phantom zone, then they have no corporeal body. Yeah, I suppose we could, we'll, we'll give them, we'll suspend their bodily functions for the, for the duration of the visit. <laughs> Just for the sake of the episode and so that we don't have to go down any unpleasant roads. Yeah, no, we don't have to do that. Um, yeah. And, and and the bit where Will, where they ask Willoway to shut the computer down at the end of this fight, well, what are we going to do it? It's like, well, you know, you people aren't very nice. <laughs> I don't think I want to do that for you. Like, man. He relented awfully quickly, though. Yeah. And it just, it was just, I, I felt like they just needed to fill in some lines of dialogue or something. Anyway, so um, let, let's take a couple points that just occurred to me in this episode because of the I, literally the whole episode went wrong for me when they walked through the, the portal and liana says oh mr whiskers needs to stretch his legs it and went th- wrong for me during the opening credits let's be real well those are the same as every episode so i, I mean, know but i did no make further a, wrong. i did make an observation during the opening credits that i want to bring up at some point well this is only the second one that's had credits so i know yeah, but, but still i saw something and i thought ah oh, hey i'd be pissed off if i if that were me okay anyway so they come through and she says well he needs to stretch his legs and i'm thinking wait a minute at the end of every episode they go about five steps away from where they're saying goodbye to the people and they pass through a portal next week they pop through a portal and they're all like oh we better make camp for the night here i'm tired <laughs> It's like they've walked like ten steps from well, the last assuming, episode. Assuming, based on based you know. on past episodes, assuming that each new zone is uh, an episode that we're seeing. I don't want to. I don't want to use the phrase real time, but oh, well, e- e- pardon. Well, I was going to say. I mean, in, in the in one of the episodes, uh, uh, the one with John Saxon, he yeah. did recount the the zones they had passed through. Exactly. So if we're going to f- use that as as a pattern, then yes, exactly. Uh, it's been, you know, last, the last episode was, oh, hell, I don't even re- want to remember. Um, there was an act of love. Oh, God. I, oh, no, Funhouse. Oh, Funhouse. Last so. episode. So did they just come from the Funhouse? Which was an awfully short zone, too. Yeah. Yeah. And prior to that was, was uh, an act of an love. An act of love. So is yeah, the, they've, is they've the walked about 100 yards. Yeah. <laughs> they've walked about 100 yards. 
uh, maybe 200 across the, the zone, and then uh, they've come along here. And, and the other thing is, if the cat needs to stretch his legs, let the damn cat walk. He's got four legs. He can walk just as fast as they can. And the cat's not going to run away because it's attached to Liana. Yeah, it's an intelligent hyperspace alien cat. I mean, it, 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 it's, yeah. Anyway, so that's, unless when you're in the portal, you walk for seven days before you come out the other side. Ooh. Which, then that would be real time, and then we could, then we could. That wouldn't explain the pilot episode. No, it would not. That would be like a, con- so therefore, yeah, no. Yeah, it does not. I don't think that's the way it works. Okay, so now my next question is if the computer can take the men and make them disappear and and then later reappear, for that matter, uh, why did it need that robot army to try to kill people? Invaders? Well, I mean, but it when it went after the women, it went after the women. It didn't go, yeah, zap. Well, from what I could gather, and this, again, this is not a proper rationalization because it is stupid, but... If we're going to suspend this belief, like, incredibly high, uh, my understanding is that the machine sent all of the Watchers after the women because they were women, and women were trying to hurt it. I, well, that's why it sent the robots, yes. I, I, I absolutely agree. That's why it sent the robots uh, against the women is because the women hurt it, and so it wanted to kill the women. But again, it just seems like it already has this amazingly awesome weapon at its disposal. It could hurt them real bad by putting them in the zone. Well, forever. I kind of get the feeling that is not something that that is not a normal function. That is something that the one gal somehow managed to do because she had to go in and well, I don't know what exactly she that she did. Did she She moved some of those boards with she, the incredibly big resistors and yeah, on them uh, so trying to find some kind of competent story element to make that work is a bit out of my reach at this point. Yeah, we're, you're not gonna. We're not gonna work our plot around this. No, I, I don't think we really can. I. I mean, I kind of got the feeling that that the the computer could not do that. But it could bring the men back as uh, it could bring the men back as night visitors and change their personalities. Yes. So How? why didn't they just have them do that at the end of the episode explicitly? Could well, you, could you bring the men not? back and make them nice? Because well, mm-hmm. I think Willoway might have done that. Why not just bring the men back? I mean, if this was a regular function of the computer, why not just bring the men back when the women thought, when the computer thought that the women were, were threatening it? Because after all, the computer had been built by a man, even though the thing's got a woman's voice. You know, I don't know. There was just something kind of really off about that. That did the, the fact that it was a woman's voice did it subservient to the men. Yeah, I mean, that was what I had to take it to be. But um, you know, there was no sisterhood there with the women. No, absolutely. And of none. course, there, I, I got the impression that none of the men knew how to work that thing. Oh no, none of them did. Just just the just that one woman who was the daughter of the man who built it. It's like they have absolutely no idea how any of their tech works. Yeah, it works by uh, I tell women to do it, and then they do it, and uh, and sandwiches. <laughs> I don't know. It 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 was a, it was a painful painful episode. Um, we learn where Willoway worked, NASA, JPL, and Caltech. Yeah, you know it's a funny thing. Um, I always make fun of that in talking about those opening credits. That crack about uh, Jonathan Willoway, a rebel scientist from the 1960s, and. I'm watching this show from 2015, and, you know, if somebody said, we're going to bring in a scientist from the 1960s, you would not put him in a position where you're going, hey, uh, could, you help me, uh, could you help me with my problem on my Mac? Because he'd go like, what's, what's a Mac? What's, what's that? That's you know, the other thing that really got you, me. You feel, that, you feel this 1960s gap. You look back at it, and it's like, this is, this is just ridiculous that they would think he could do anything with an advanced computer. That's just stupid. Like, exactly. But, like like but, he did with the androids when we first meet him. Yes, but, but, and, and that makes no excuse for the androids or the rote computers or anything else, but it's difficult to look at this. This show is from the 70s. So this is, viewing it from our point of view, if they said, Jonathan Willoughby, a renegade scientist from 2005, 
you'd go, oh, yeah, all right. If he was a brilliant scientist in 2005, he might still be smarter than the average guy in 2015. So, uh, but but because we're looking at it over 40 years, um, it really just makes it all the more absurd. Yeah, I had a hard time believing that he could actually make heads or tails out of that computer. And, of course, the computer itself is a complete contradiction. I mean, there are aspects of it that look highly advanced, and then you take a look at its innards and its simple circuit boards. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was just really poor. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That I mean, was, that, that that's, was... that's where I will at least give Star Trek a lot of credit, in that when they looked at their computer components, they looked like, okay, that's something pretty advanced, something that I've never seen before. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, you know, for I mean, 1960s. This, uh, sometimes when Uhura went under her console, uh, that was a pretty bog standard circuit boards underneath there. When they were when they would shoot from behind the console, looking at her face, staring through the, yeah, the thing. Yeah, but and, they only did that once. And um, uh, oh, Mud's I Mud Norman. His guts, not not obviously the redone version, but the uh, well, that's why they had the redone version redone because version. the guts were stupid. Yeah. So anyway, so not always, but yeah, I mean, a lot of the stuff like the tapes and things that they would pull from Star Trek, they did have a feel of, you know, it is a completely different technology that we wouldn't see. But yeah, the, the, those circuit boards were really, really antiquated, and I, I, I'm having trouble believing, you know, just pull one out and move it a slot over and plug yeah, it back in. Yeah, that'll change everything around. That really is difficult to to swallow. Well, then keep in mind, however, again, as you said, this is 1970s, and... Who'd seen a computer except Steve Wozniak and... And, yeah, and Steve Jobs. Uh, poss- not even not even Bill Gates. Well, uh, this is late 70s, I th- think. This, this is, yeah, this is late 70s. Uh, there was no such thing as a home computer. I mean, the only people who ever saw a computer were people who worked in, you know, buildings that housed massive mainframe systems. I mean, that was about it. You didn't really have small uh, personal computers like we do today. Uh, no one really understood what a computer was in terms of its innards, how it functioned, all of that, unless you were specifically trained in that. And that was a highly specialized job at the yeah. time. Yeah. So it's just, it this is... was one of these things where they thought they could bluff the audience. And I would even go so far as to say that the writers and, and the, the show producers, uh, the set designers, they were just as ignorant. Uh-huh. You know, and, and I'm not I'm not using that as a, as a pejorative. I mean, they just did not know. So they were projecting their own, quote unquote, ignorance onto the audience and saying, you know, well, well the audience isn't going to know. We sure as heck don't know. So we can make this. Because we don't know any better, and the audience isn't going to know any better. The problem is, is that it works great then. <laughs> now I know, but now it's it's so hard. <laughs> anyway, it, yeah. Well, we, it, so what was your thing in the credits? What was oh, your thing in the, credits? the one thing that kind of really, uh, I, I only, like again, this is the second time that I've seen the credits since rewatching this, and narrated by Race Bannon. Yeah, from and this, Johnny is, this is what I got. I mean, how much must it have just absolutely sucked for Carl Franklin, um, who played Fred, to have his character be introduced as simply Fred, a young doctor just out of medical school, after having followed Varian, a man from the 23rd century possessing awesome, awesome powers. powers. It's like, okay, talk about massive inferi- you know, an inferiority complex after that. Is like, yeah. I mean, okay, granted, we're introduced to, you know, Jared Martin's character, you know, man from the 25th century, awesome powers, and he kind of stands there with that, that smile, and he's like, ooh, what a guy. And then all of a sudden, Fred, a medical student, and you're going... He's not even a medical student. He's actually... Well, he's actually uh, out of medical actually, school. Yeah, he's a... I, yeah. He, he is a doctor just out of medical school. Yeah. I mean, that it, would I would feel very insecure <laughs> after seeing that. That, that was it's just one I of those feel things insecure that I got. based on the parts they give him in the episodes, but uh, yeah, not just and the that's, credits. That's the other thing. Now, Fred kind of sort of gets to save the day a little bit here. So glad he's able to make that poison that doesn't poison you unless you don't eat the poison poison yeah. antidote. How convenient. I mean, the only time we don't see him eat is at the big banquet that Morgan and his 
cronies are throwing for our travelers. Well, that's because he's pacing around going, we got to go get the women. That's oh, right. Sorry. Uh, okay, yeah, you can send your hate mail to Eugene. No. Uh, he's what he's doing. And, and but you're okay, right, look, it is that. It's, it's you yeah, know, okay, so. And come on, he's, he, when he, this is the, the other note I have, I'll bring it up now, because when he goes out to get his medical bag, he is chased by the only black woman in the group. Because he's having dialogue with her, and she's referring to, do you love me, or do you want to kill me? And, hey, baby, he calls yeah, her mama. Baby. He calls he her calls mama. Her I baby. know. You know, he doesn't call her sugar, but, I mean, it's so, so it's degrading really for tacky. her. And it's degrading for him, too, because it's such a stereotypical 1970s black exploitation kind of thing. And, and it's like, did she have to be black because the censors wouldn't allow anything a black man to be talking to a white woman that way? I mean, the whole thing just it, and I, irritates I, I, the I, heck out of me. I dare say it was because interracial relationships were, I mean, keep in mind, this is, this is not it. that far off from Requiem for Methuselah. Mm. We're only about, what, 10 years? Mm-hmm. And the only reason they got away with that kiss is, as we said before in past episodes, is because it was forced. But we're st- we're just ten years away. And- oh, Plato's stepchildren. Oh, yeah, I'm sure you're right. It's Plato's stepchildren. Mark with this. I'm thinking. Um, it's like that's the one with Hottie in it. Yeah, Raina. You know, you're right. Plato's stepchildren with the with the forced kiss between Kirk and Uhura. So here we are. We're just ten years later. Actually, a little less if my if my math is right. And society has not yet moved forward enough to accept any kind of willing interracial relationship, even if it's just a friendship. I mean, uh, it's just it's just not going to happen, especially yeah. if the woman is going to try to suggest that there might be some kind of uh, affection there. They have yeah, to go with a black it, woman. It, I mean, we look at it by today's standards and find it insulting, rightly so, because what this is, it's a reflection of the really ignorant social norms we had at that day. So in a really stupid sense, the episode is actually kind of serving some sort of a social purpose, but probably not in the way that they originally intended. No, no. I, I don't think that his dialogue with her was intended in any way to portray anything in, in that. I mean, it, he was their dialogue was about relationships between men and women. Right. You know, just they don't have to be I know, but they can't have that conversation right and she can't between two non yeah and and non, she cannot ask the question do you love me right and, and then and even that's, and even then yeah. at the end when they say goodbye there's still some you know i will miss you and he says yeah me too you know so obviously they are still suggesting that there's some kind of emotion there i mean he's he i'm i'm, I'm sure that he likes her and that at this point he regards her as a friend, and I dare say if they had stuck around long enough, we probably would have seen a wedding between the two of them. But they can't... Just before they chucked him in the volcano. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. You, you, oh, we're going to have a wedding. Oh, we know this great zone just two two weeks back. Two Let's weeks go back. there. Let's go past the uh, amusement park and, uh, you know, that's, uh, yeah. I'm sure but... they've overthrown their volcano god by now. Ah, uh, yes. But at least with Fred, he got to have some kind of action. He got to theoretically save the day by simply pouring liquid back and forth from one little <laughs> test tube to another. And once the color changed just the way he wanted it, bingo! I think this is it. I can work on a more Joe, one I've later. got it. Which, of course, had no purpose also because... When he went, he gave the formula to uh, Willoway and, and Varian and Scott, and then the queen came in with, with the, the antidote. antidote for them anyway. It's like, and oh, that I was, was going to give you this anyway. And that was the real antidote. So, yeah, the whole thing was a complete waste of time, it turns out. As were most of the plot complications in this episode, which is the weird part. All of them just were really just like, ooh, we're still running a little short. Yeah, but uh, how— We started off and we were running— 41 minutes short and now we need to we need to add a few things to this how many, 45 minute story how many times have we seen these kinds of wasteful moments 
in past episodes. I mean, this is just another one. The only this difference just, is that this one's got a lot of them. That's what it is. This one has just done so many of them. And it, it just it was like, I think it was about the third or fourth one that hit me. And I'm like, that's just not, this is not going anywhere. It's like when, when they had Leanna side up with them. Um, to what end? And then we to don't what end? She see never her. did anything with it. We we barely see her again. She, we she's hardly ever see her until, the episode. until towards the the latter part where they're going to confuse the watcher. Yeah, that worked real well. Oh, that it? was fun. Yeah, I enjoyed that enormously. But then she it's... finally shows up. But aside yeah. from that, she becomes completely invisible and is irrelevant to the story. And I I just kept wondering, you know, it's, in, it's even in my notes. I wonder where Liana's gone to. She was there in a couple of scenes, and they were they were stupidly treating her as if she was part of the group. And, and, yet I, this, and I know that was sort of what they were trying to do, but I mean, it just is it but defies this, credibility. This would have been an Particularly, excellent time, well, you know. For example, okay, maybe instead of Scott finding out that the men are being poisoned, Liana can find it out. Hey, she could have done something good. And she could have done something about it. She could have gotten her hands because she's a woman and she's to be trusted. She gets her hands on the antidote and she manages to sneak it in. You know, but, oh, no, we can't Uh, have that. How how about how about this? Uh, They say to Liana, you know, as a sister woman, you're welcome to stay here with us and uh, or you may go on your way. Uh, But the men are staying here. They're breeding stock because they don't have the same attitudes. And so that's going to be good. Okay, one. And, you know, a little bit of protest here and there. Oddly enough, 14-year-old boy doesn't go, whoa, ha, I've hit the jackpot. But um, Varian then pulls this, yeah, Leanna, why don't you just stick around with these people, you shirker, making us do all the work. And and and, and Scott's like, Varian, what, what are, are you, you talking doing? about? Yeah. Well, that doesn't make any sense. And, and Leanna's standing there going, huh? huh? And Varian, yeah, and you make this boy here do double the work. And Scott's like, what? I don't do double the work. And Leanna's like, huh? And everyone in the room is not looking at them going, this is the worst, stupidest pantomime. It's, it's, a, it's the worst bluff. I've ever seen. The only one that does it right is Willoway, who instantly catches on and has that sort of smirky smile on his face that... that he was doing when he was fooling John Saxon's character a couple of zones ago, where it's like, yeah, but we um, will always do Yeah, he's do, so it's this. What what Varian is doing is second nature to Willoway. Uh huh. It, it, yeah, <laughs> it's like it was terrible. It was terrible. Oh, okay. So last thing, Varian, new power. Oh, he can mind meld. He can he can now take the pain from another person onto himself, and he does that with Scott. And that's just this. And there's also another brief scene. He really, really is carrying off the fatherly thing. Yes, he is with with Scott. He is really taking him as as his own son. And it it again give Jared Martin a little bit of credit. Whenever he does that, he seems to do a very good job. I agree. It's, that that it's seems one of, to be it's, the motion he can play. It's is the one fatherly. thing about it that I really do like. And if there is any shining moment to this episode, it's that scene where Scott is just now hallucinating because of what the, the withdrawal from the poison is causing. And Varian is now going to try to comfort and then try to take away any of the pain that Scott is going through. It was a good scene. Unnecessary in the grand scheme of things, I think, but it was a good scene nonetheless because I like the relationship. And it it does sort of track. It makes sense. I don't have a problem with it because, as we've said in the past, Varian took an immediate liking and not in an ugly sort of way to Scott right from the very pilot because he saw that Scott was a very inquisitive young man and Mm -hmm. just he was the first person that Varian was willing to trust and share his secrets with so i don't have a problem that the relationship has progressed to this point it does not bother me so i think this is one of the few things uh let me change that how about the only thing uh, that this story has that i thought was worthwhile 
but it's so brief and so mired under everything else that by the time the episode was over, I had completely forgotten about it. Yeah, it's it's. <clears throat> Anyway, this episode once again has renewed my calls for the cancellation of Fantastic Journey. Fantastic Journey needs to be canceled. And this if, show is no good. You know, the thing that slays me is that I've never seen this one before. This was my first time watching this one. When I saw Fantastic Journey on its initial run, I only got as far as Funhouse. Hmm. So this so was you've the, got, what, two more? Yeah, two more episodes I've never seen Oh, the joy you've got. So I, I haven't seen any of them. So, I think I may have seen the pilot, but I have not seen any of them. So, so this is I think, all I think that's why territory for I me. got angry. I mean, with the past episodes, it was like disgust, but I still had some kind of memory, something. There was some level of familiarity, even if it was really distant. There was some kind of familiarity uh, regarding what we were watching at the time. This was a fresh watch. I have never seen this before, and and I was just aghast at a gog. Yeah, at how everything in this story was just so god awful bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, not just bad; it was insulting bad. And I even have that in my notes. And you, you stole my thunder, you rat. <laughs> <laughs> insulting bad. I'm well, sorry. no, it's just that I I had said that, and and I'd mentioned this. Uh, when we first reviewed Act of Love, I said that you know, an Act of Love is right up there with the imp. And I even said that during the show. I remember that. And I said, true enough, but this episode actually created feelings of utter disgust. We're approaching the naked Montague territory with ah, this yes. dreadful piece of garbage. Yeah, I, I, I will admit it, it, it raised my ire. When I was watching it, I, I mean, I didn't get that of the naked Montague. So, uh, you know, that I, I feel the imp is worse than the naked Montague. But that's could just be because my utter disgust from people going, oh, boy, let's go play a game. <laughs> yeah, that may just be that that does that to me. Um, but uh, this one, I, I don't know that this is worse than, say, an act of love, which is terrible. Ooh. But at the same time... Man, I don't know. I, I think I have to say this Something about is, this one rubs me wrong. I have to more. say this one is worse. I mean, you know? th there is nothing. It's it's like the difference between, say, poison ivy and, and say, diarrhea. You know, one... They're both very uncomfortable, but one probably is more irritating than the other, maybe? I don't know. I, I'm not, I'm not going to say which one's which, but... Well, well, this is either poison ivy or diarrhea. I'm just simply going to go by initial <laughs> gut reaction. <laughs> Act of love, I thought, was stupid. I mean, and it had me just shaking my head with the... SMH. Yeah, yeah, there was a lot of, a lot of hashtag SMH in, in Act of Love. I could not believe, you know, as, and I don't, don't necessarily want to rehash that entire episode, but... I couldn't believe that this advanced technology, mm -hmm. this advanced people, could resort to such idol worship. Right. But now we've got this episode, and all I could think of is I'm really disgusted. I mean, disgusted to the point of just really angry. I, I it, takes meet... a, it takes a lot to put me in that frame of mind. I want to meet DC Fontana someday and ask her about some of these episodes that she's done for Logan's Run and, and Fantastic you know, Journey. I that. met her one time, but boy, was she not in a good mood that day. Maybe somebody had already asked her about well, this. Episode. Well, to be honest, it was in between seasons one and two of Next Gen, and oh, there was a right writer strike she, uh, going yeah. on, and there was a lot of bad blood that was beginning to yeah. kind of boil behind the scenes, so she was not in the friendliest of moods. And at the time she was out there trying to push the new war of the world's TV series. Mm. So she did not really come across. I mean, I, I had read one of her books, which I actually thought was quite good. It was a star Trek novel. And I actually thought it was quite nice. And I went up and I, I complimented her on it. And she gave me just one of the most, Oh, the most painful. Thank yous. It's like, <laughs> just trying, just trying to say thank you was, I, I'm I'm providing you a service by saying I appreciate that you liked my book. I mean, she was think, really in a bad state of mind that day. So I, for me to walk up to her then and say, "Let's talk Fantastic Journey," probably would have seen me chucked out of the convention hall. 
I had a similar circumstance with Straczynski where I told him it was an episode I, you know, I had been watching some of the early Babylon 5. Yeah, I like that one. And the response back was, yeah, that one wasn't very good. I'm not happy with that episode. Oh, all. believe me, so, I've, I've met Joe, too, and yeah. he's another one that yeah. is, he's just a curmudgeon. <laughs> That's all there is to it. So uh, let's, let's sum this one up. Uh, it's one of the greatest episodes of television ever. Or it's one of the worst things we've ever seen. Uh, can't be anything in between because that's the way these things work. So which is it? Well, I would have to say this is one of the greatest episodes of the worst television ever seen. Fair enough. I, I'm going to go with that. This would not be the first. If you wanted to get a good feel for what Fantastic Journey is about, this would not be the episode oh, that not I would to start suggest with. that you walk with. Yeah, no. you should definitely save this one um, and, and then look fondly back on it after you watch the next two, which will probably be even even worse. You know, this, I, I, this really does follow the same trajectory as Man from Atlantis does, if you think about it. Because the pilot for that, at least it had some – it was trying to be something kind of science fiction-y for Man from Atlantis. And, and I remember walking away from that not – I mean, I, there were elements of that story that I thought were just inane. But on the whole – I was. I did not feel like my intelli- my intelligence had been insulted while watching it. Same thing with Fantastic Journey. I remember saying even that watching the the pilot, I kind of liked it. I but I was liking it for more nostalgic reasons than anything else. But as a well, whole, you have no nostalgia for this episode. So no. You but know, even you're... then, I mean, looking back at the episodes we have seen, I th- th- there's no question that we are seeing a total decline. In any quality that might have been there the previous week, there's less in the next episode. That's the pattern. It's it's just going downhill. And at this rate, I mean, right now, this is the rock bottom. But, oh, God, I can't even bear to think where the next two episodes are going to take us. But we will go there, dear listeners, as we as we watch these episodes so you don't have to. So we're, you yes, we are providing you a service so that you can listen to us anguish and just moan and groan over how god awful bad these things really are so that you can laugh at our misfortune while saying, I'm not going to watch that piece of crap. And then you'll go watch it. And, and you'll watch it anyway because you really got to find out. Is it as bad as they really say? It is that bad. It really is this bad. This so let's just say, listeners, we dare you. We dare you. We double dog dare you to watch. Oh man, you went for the big Find one. Find it on YouTube. It's there. Fantastic journey. How else do you think Turn you're about. watching it? Watch that and see if it doesn't make your ears bleed from the stupidity. Oh, make your eyes bleed as well. Eyes, ch- just, eyes I mean, just, ears, just make your nose, bl- brain melt, other cavities, whatever. You wear a diaper. You're gonna That's turn. All I have you're to gonna say. turn into a pile of porridge by the time that episode is over. <laughs> well. Ben, it's been a, a bun, bundle of laughs. <laughs> oh, this was a hoot. <laughs> and uh, thanks for joining me. Oh, a pleasure, really. And li- listeners, we hope you'll join us all again next time on Fusion Patrol. Jeers. Fusion Patrol is a Lone Locust production. Like us, leave us a review on iTunes. Or... Stop by and visit at our website, FusionPatrol.com. Find us on Facebook or Twitter. Search for Fusion Patrol. Or just drop us a note at feedback at FusionPatrol.com. Our music is Fight the Future by Amber Wolf. Cheers. <laughs>